The United Kingdom now has a new monarch, and this has profound implications for everything from national identity to the currency used in my home country of the United Kingdom. But it also has implications for climate change. Let me explain. On the 8th of September 2022, Queen Elizabeth II died, and the crown has now passed to her eldest son, King Charles III, as he's now titled. And King Charles has a long-standing reputation for being outspoken on environmental issues, ranging from organic farming to climate action. I wanted to break down some key climate change speeches that the king has given over the years before he took on the crown and see how they stack up. For context, I've worked on climate change for around 11 years, first as a climate scientist. I have a doctorate in atmospheric physics from the University of Oxford, and now as a climate change journalist and YouTuber, obviously. So yeah, do that whole like, comment and subscribe thing, please. And of course, there's an important conversation to be had about the role of a monarch in a 21st century country, or the role that the monarchy has already had on colonialism and environmental destruction and injustice. And I'm very curious to see your comments on these questions in the comments below. But the reality is that the king's words will, and already have, influenced a great number of people. And so it's those words that I'm going to be focusing on today. Okay, so let's get started. And where better to start than the 2009 climate change negotiations, which are now infamous for being a failed effort to reach a deal on climate change. Now, let's see what King, now King Charles, said at this event. Take a moment to consider the opportunities if we succeed. Imagine a healthier, safer, and more sustainable, economically robust world. Now, I think this is a really interesting and important framing. Often we talk about the dangers we're trying to avoid when we talk about climate change, but we overlook a lot of the benefits that we'll reap through acting on climate change, ranging on cutting down air pollution to cleaner food, boost to the economy. And so it's really interesting seeing uh, Charles making these points in his speech way back in 2009. So I've been privileged to talk with some of the world's most eminent experts and to listen to the wisdom of some of the world's indigenous people. Now, again, a really underrated point. Across climate negotiations, people refer to the science, people keep talking about the science, and as a scientist, I'm definitely on board with that. But people often overlook the value of indigenous wisdom on climate change, on environmental issues. And indigenous people are indeed on the front lines of climate change, both experiencing the impacts the most severely and also standing up against environmental destruction across the entire world. And we have only seven years before we lose the levers of control. Now this is interesting. I'm not entirely sure what this seven years refers to. At this point in time, the climate change negotiations, the two degree temperature limit was very much the focus. Now to achieve that, we need to reach net zero, so overall zero CO2 emissions in the second half of the 21st century. Now the later we leave cutting those emissions, the harder it gets, and we have continued to leave cutting those emissions, making it a harder and harder task. But those seven years have expired, and I personally would argue that that two degree temperature limit, keeping global warming under that, is still very much on the table. Although I do think some scientists would dispute that. So I'm not entirely on board with this seven year time limit claim. And also I don't think it's that helpful to go on about time limits for reasons I'll, I'll go into a bit later. Now one example that has been high on, on, on my agenda for the last two years is that of tropical rainforests. They also absorb and hold vast quantities of carbon that would otherwise be in the atmosphere. Without a solution to tropical deforestation, there is no solution to climate change. So the impact of deforestation is indeed incredibly significant and also often incredibly overlooked. While burning fossil fuels is the main driver of global warming, we're not going to be able to stop the world heating up as long as we keep deforestation going. And actually, only a few months ago, there was a study that showed that deforestation had led to far greater emissions than previously thought. 
and that the impact of deforestation had doubled in just the last two decades. Surely now then is the time to recognise that we cannot have capitalism without nature's capital. We cannot sustain our human economy without sustaining nature's economy. So a lot of researchers and activists would argue a much stronger point and argue that we cannot have capitalism and maintain the climate and limit global warming, that the two things are fundamentally incompatible. To be clear, there are also researchers who argue the other point, that capitalism could in some way be modified in order to stop climate change. Regardless, it's very interesting to hear Monarch stating that capitalism in its current form is incompatible with stopping climate change so long as it doesn't see the value of the natural world. And of course, this is an incredibly valid point. What's the point in an economy on a dead planet? I could only appeal to you to listen to the cries of those who are already suffering from the impact of climate change. So here he's using the present tense. He's talking about the fact that climate change is already causing suffering, which indeed it was in 2009. And yet at that time, and still even today, a lot of people talk about climate change as this future threat, something that's going to happen in the distant future. And so that use of the present tense is really valuable. It emphasizes that climate change isn't just something that will happen tomorrow, it's already here today. And by today, I mean 2009. Remember that our children and grandchildren will ask not what our generation said, but what it did. So let us give an answer of which we can be proud. So really valuable point here and one that has stayed very relevant today with all this talk of net zero, which we hear all the time today. People are increasingly willing to talk a big game when it comes to climate action, but then don't have the action to back it up. And as uh, King Charles points out here, what matters isn't our conversation. It's our action. Let's fast forward now to 2015 and to a climate negotiation which is famous, thankfully, for a good reason. That's the Paris Climate Talks, which led to the now famous Paris Climate Agreement, which led to every country in the world, apart from the Vatican, agreeing to limit global warming to well under 2 degrees Celsius and ideally under 1.5 degrees Celsius. Let's see what King Charles said at this event. Humanity faces many threats, but none is greater than climate change. It magnifies every hazard and tension of our existence. So here, King Charles is drawing the link between climate change and all the other threats that we face. This is really valuable because normally when we talk about climate change, we talk about it as kind of this separate issue. We say, oh, I care about the economy, I care about climate change, I care about people being displaced from their homes. But all those other things we care about are also climate change issues because, as pointed out here, uh, climate change magnifies those issues. We know we cannot adapt sufficiently to go on as we are. So this is completely correct. We cannot adapt to the levels of global warming that we will see by the end of this century or before if we don't curb our global emissions. Just take things like extreme temperature rise, which will make certain parts of the world uninhabitable, or sea level rise, which will displace many millions of people. To avoid catastrophe, we must restrict climate change to less than two degrees, which requires a dramatic reduction in carbon emissions. This really shows something from the time, which is that all the focus was on limiting global warming to under two degrees Celsius. That's what most negotiators and policymakers and scientists thought was going to be the focus of the talks. But the past climate agreement did uh, agree to limit global warming to two degrees with the ambitious goal to try to limit global warming to well under 1.5 degrees. At the time, there wasn't actually that much research on what limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees would mean. Since then, there's been a huge amount more, and we see that limiting global warming to this stricter limit would protect us from things like additional tipping points, as well as protecting the most vulnerable people and most vulnerable ecosystems in the world. 
And so, while uh, I completely understand, given the context that everyone was focusing on two degrees, why uh, King Charles mentions two degrees and not 1.5 degrees in this talk, the conversation has definitely shifted from then to focus more on limiting global warming to under 1.5 degrees. We are always hearing nowadays that all our actions must be based on good science. Why then, when it comes to climate change, is this apparently no longer applicable? So as a climate scientist whose climate science is very often overlooked, I'd just say it's very nice to hear this being said in the speech. Now let's move on to a, another climate negotiations and we're fast forwarding to the most recent negotiations last year's in Glasgow in 2021. Um, Glasgow, of course, being a part of the United Kingdom, which King Charles is now king of. Given how recent this was, let's see what King Charles's rhetoric looked like there. Because time has quite literally run out. So yes and no here. So I mentioned this 1.5 degree temperature limit. And there's actually a lot of disagreement about whether it still is achievable or not. Either way, it's clearly right on the edge of what's achievable, if it's achievable at all. But even if we missed this 1.5 degree temperature limit, which would have serious impacts, that's not game over. Every fraction of a degree matters. Every fraction of a degree we can avoid saves lives. So for this temperature limit, yeah, maybe time has run out. But for action on climate change in general, as long as there's a planet and people to keep fighting for, it's still worth continuing fighting. With a growing global population, creating ever-increasing demand on the planet's finite resources, we have to reduce emissions urgently. So emphasizing overpopulation, as he does here, I consider quite misleading. It implies that overpopulation is the leading driver of climate change, or at least one of the leading drivers on climate change. Whereas the reality is that the poorest 50% of the world's population, and that 50% is generally driving population growth, are responsible for just 10% of global emissions. Compare that to the richest 10% of the world's population, who are responsible for 50% of the world's emissions. So the problem doesn't seem to be coming from the bottom 50%, but rather the richest 10%, and even more so from the richest 1%. By focusing on something like overpopulation, it effectively shifts the blame onto the poorest people in the world from the richer people in the world and the richest people in the world, which I think we can safely say includes King Charles. This uh, misrepresents what's driving the problem, which ultimately is overconsumption more than it is overpopulation. Putting a value on carbon, thus making carbon capture solutions more economical, is therefore absolutely critical. So both putting a price on carbon and carbon capture solutions could play really valuable roles in the fight against climate change. But carbon capture and storage is still a very, very limited technology. Uh, here is a very complicated plot from the latest intergovernmental panel on climate change report. The bigger the line, the bigger the impact it could have on emissions, and the bluer the line, the, uh, the better that would be for the economy. Now here's carbon capture and storage in that plot you can see that that line is very small and very red, which means it could have limited impact by 2030 and would be pretty expensive. So carbon capture and storage as a leading solution, I don't think so, at least not anytime soon. Nature is our best teacher. Accelerating nature-based solutions will be vital to our efforts. Absolutely true. Uh, nature-based solutions are incredibly important, not just for helping us absorb emissions, for example, but also from helping us protect ourselves from the impacts of climate change. Take things like coral reefs and mangroves, which can protect coastal areas. Or take things like urban green spaces, which can protect us from devastating extreme heat. Call for a global systems level solution based on radically transforming 
our current fossil fuel based economy to one that is genuinely renewable. So he's not saying anything very interesting here, but I just love this clip because of the cut to Scott Morrison, who um, is the former Australian leader and is infamous for holding up climate action both within his country and internationally. So <laughs> good job, whoever was editing this footage. Together, we are working to drive trillions of dollars in support of transition across 10 of the most emitting and polluting industries. They include energy, agriculture, transportation, health systems and fashion. Often when we talk about climate change, we just focus on the electricity system, but that doesn't do so much for many other sectors, such as fashion, such as agriculture. And we absolutely need to focus on decarbonizing those sectors as well. So it's useful to bring that up at these climate negotiations. The cost of inaction is far greater than the cost of prevention. Often when people and politicians argue that climate change is too expensive to stop, they avoid a very important part of that equation, which is that climate change itself is already and will become even more expensive in the future. And so if we can't afford to stop climate change, what on earth would make you feel like we can afford climate change? Now, the final clip that I want to show you is not from a climate negotiations, and that's kind of why I want to show you it. Um, it's from an event which actually had nothing to do with climate change at all, but happened to coincide with the uh, devastating heat wave which faced much of Western Europe and led to record-breaking temperatures in the UK. Let's see what King Charles said at the time. These commitments around net zero have never been more vitally important as we all swelter under today's alarming <coughs> record temperatures across Britain and Europe. The climate crisis really is a genuine emergency and tackling it is utterly essential. Here, King Charles is really drawing the links between climate change and something that is happening here and now. And it's really amazing to see him doing that. And to be clear, he is absolutely justified in doing that. Research has shown that every heat wave happening is now made more intense and more likely because we have heated the planet up. And in particular, this heat wave that the UK and Western Europe faced was made at least 10 times more likely because we've heated the planet up. So it's clear that King Charles has been incredibly outspoken about climate change, bringing up some really important points. But there are some big question marks to me. Will he continue like this now that he's king? Just how big an influence will this have on the United Kingdom and on the rest of the world? And what are the overall effects of the monarchy on the economy and environment of our planet? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. And if you're wondering about that 1.5 degree temperature limit and whether it's possible or not, make sure to check out my video over here. And make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss my next video all about the lies that are spread about climate change. Okay, until next time, bye.